And so let's pray, and then we'll open up our Bibles um, in a couple of places. Well, maybe just one. We can flick to other places as we go. Father God, we would ask this morning that you would bless us and keep us in your word, that we, you would enlighten our mind with a view of changing our heart, that we would see clearly and not be blind uh, by devoting ourselves to the idols that are found in the world. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, let's turn um, in our Bibles to Psalm 115. And this is the fourth lesson. And we're going to be looking at the subject of how uh, sensitive you are spiritually. So how sensitive you are spiritually. So the last three lessons, uh, the first one has been principle and promise that um, God's word promises, makes promises and keeps them. And then the second lesson was truth and experience. So we don't always learn more by experiencing more. And then last week we saw that life is life under compulsion, meaning that if we are not full on the things that God wants us to be full on, then our lives are directed by compulsions, not desires, but compulsions. Um, so for instance, uh, one example might be that if a person is hungry, that they're not actually hungry, they could just be thirsty. They're just not drinking enough. And so their, their body's feeling empty, but they just need more water. They don't necessarily need more food. And so we are driven um, by compulsions when we are empty. So this morning, we're looking at um, how spiritually sensitive we are and what happens to a Christian when they are no longer spiritually sensitive. So to do that, we are going to turn to Psalm 115. And I will quote from other places like Jeremiah 2 and Matthew 13, which we could also turn to, I guess, um, as we go throughout the morning. I'm not going to read the entire chapter of Psalm 115. Um, no, we could. It's only 18 verses. So, not to us, O Lord, not to us, uh, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. Their mouths, they have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, uh, feet but do not walk, and they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. No, I think we will leave it there because I don't want to lose the focus of the first eight verses is where we are. The entire psalm is a psalm of praise and recognition. Um, the, di the distinction between the one true God, recognizing the one true God, and what happens when you give yourself over to idols is that you can no longer recognize um, the one true God. We'll, we'll see that. Um, <clears throat> in Matthew 13, perhaps we could just turn there really quickly just so you can see how Jesus quotes Isaiah, but he's really building off the back of this same question of spiritual sensitivity. So Matthew 13, it's the chapter of kingdom parables and Jesus has a lot to say about um, the kingdom in Matthew chapter 13 in terms of parables and then he gives the purpose of parables uh, verse 10 then the disciples came and said to him why do you speak to them in parables and he answered them to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven but to them it has not been given for the one who has more will be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear but never understand, you will indeed see but never perceive, 
for this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. So we're going to be looking at these. Jeremiah chapter 2, I'll just, just quote this briefly, is where God's people have forsaken the Lord their God, uh, the, the founding of living waters, and decided to hewn out cisterns for themselves that can hold no water. And the question is, why would you do that? Why would you exchange a God of living water for something that doesn't produce or give you anything? You know, why would any mud, anybody make that type of exchange? It is, doesn't seem to make any, any sense whatsoever unless you understand it in the context of idolatry. Now, there is a phrase going around popularized by a man named Greg Beale uh, in his book, We Become What We Worship. And uh, Greg Beale, I don't think he actually gave John Mackay any credit, but John Mackay is the one who came up with that phrase in his commentary on Jeremiah chapter, well, Jeremiah, and in chapter 2, um, where the people of God become like the very things that they make, um, he used the phrase, we become what we worship. And Professor Mackay was in the Free Church College, the one that I uh, studied in Edinburgh, and he came up with that phrase. The question is, is, or that I have, is that I'm not sure it is... Um, a brilliant title simply because I think there's a few things that need to be understood. Let me start with this then. There is a difference between reading God's word carefully and then reading God's word with wisdom. So I'm going to tell you a, a, a short story and you probably have a similar story here in America about a man who is invited to come and fix another man's engine because the engine will not work, and he's had several other men around to try and fix it, and no one can get it fixed. So he phones this one man up, and he says, will you come around and see if you can fix it? And he says, sure. On the way to fixing the engine, he buys a hammer, and he walks up to this engine, he asks the owner to start it over, and it starts over and it jumps around a bit, and he takes his hammer, and he hits it in one place, and the engine starts, and he walks away. And the man goes, oh, thank you so much. Now I can get on with farming my land and doing the business that I need to do. Just send me the bill. So the next day, the bill comes in. I'll, sp in, I'll put it in dollars. And it's two and a half thousand dollars. And the man goes, what? Two and a half thousand, for what? And he says, well, it was $47 for the hammer, right? It was, you know, 50, $53 for um, my time. Okay, well that, that accounts to a hundred dollars. A hundred dollars, how about a hundred? Yes, hundred dollars. What is, what's the, what's the other 2,400 for? And the man says, well, because I knew where to hit. I knew where to hit. Okay? And what tends to happen is we tend to equate knowledge with experience and wisdom, and you can't. Because the knowledge of where to hit in Psalm 115 is learn over time asking God for wisdom and I've probably spent what the last 24 years trying to understand the human heart even though I read God's Word I spent the last 24 years trying to learn where to hit that 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 spot um, and you can't get that necessarily from the Word um, directly because every person you speak to is a different engine, okay? Every person you speak to needs to be um, sort of tapped in a different area in order to make them function. Well, this is even more important when it comes to idolatry. So we're going to work, walk through Psalm 115, and we're going to ask these four questions. And that is... In the context of what we've learned so far, that when we educate children in the faith or educate children generally, 
Children are up against a number of things, such as being full, being empty, the desire for experience, the lack of experience. And today, we're going to look at what actually blinds us from seeing the right answers. So here's the first question. Um, why do we turn to idols? It's question number two, how do we make idols? Question number three, what do we make when we make an idol? And then, of course, what is the influence of an idol over our life? So, number one, why do we turn? Number two, how do we make? Three, what do we make? And four, what is their influence? Make sense? Okay. In Matthew 13, um, one of the striking things you'll find is that Jesus tells a parable. And then he explains, <clears throat> as we have read, that there are some people who don't get the parable. And he says, I speak in parables so that you would understand, so that it's been revealed to you, but to others it's not been revealed. And then what happens is the disciples come to Jesus and say, well, can you explain to us the parable of the Because we don't get it. And what Jesus is pointing out at that point is, is if you don't get it, then you are not as spiritually sensitive to the things of God as you think you are. I'll give you an example. So if I tell a joke, or if you tell a joke that's common in America, and you have to then explain that joke to the person, it is because they don't get it. They don't get the punchline. And when you have to explain the joke, it, your very explanation is telling them you don't understand, you don't get it. So when Jesus has to explain a parable to his own disciples, what he's actually showing them is that even their heart has become spiritually dull to the things of God, or else they would get it. So it is entirely possible that when the word of God is being proclaimed in a church, that if your heart is given over to idolatry, you will not receive the teaching uh, as clear and simple as the truth. And that's not because the teaching necessarily isn't clear and simple, but rather because your heart is dull and not therefore able to receive the teaching clearly. So we'll go through Psalm 115 so that you can see this for yourself. In Jeremiah 2, I'll just say this before we get to Psalm 115. The, the people of God have created two evils. They have forsaken God, that's the first evil, and then they have turned to something that only something else which only God can provide, but they've not turned to God for it. They've turned to cisterns that cannot hold any water or give any water. They've turned from God, who is the living water. And so there's two evils, turning from and turning to something other than God. It's the same action, but God in Jeremiah describes that as two evils. In Psalm 115, the first thing you need to recognize above everything else, and you should know this from Genesis, is that the maker is always greater than what is made. Okay? Who understands that? Yep. So the maker is always greater than what is made. Now I want you to think of something you have made. So children, have you been at home and ever made anything with cardboard? Whether it be a castle or be a boat, you have. Okay. Have you ever uh, drew a picture, and it's, it, even though it can be a beautiful picture, have you made beautiful pictures? Yeah? Now, are you more valuable than that picture? Of course you are. Are you more valuable than the cardboard ship or boat that you make? Yeah? Of course you are, because the maker is always greater than the thing that is made. No. <laughs> This is really important when we are understanding Psalm 115. Firstly, because who's greater than us? Who? who? God, yeah. God is greater than us, and God is greater than us because he made, made yeah, because God made us. Okay, so it's very simple, isn't it? Now, I want you to think of this. If a man, okay, chops down a tree, 
and he uses half of that tree to make a fire so that he can cook his dinner on it. And he uses the other half of the tree and sculpts it into a shape with ears and eyes and mouths and that. And he puts it there and he bells down in worship. Who is greater, the maker or the thing that he has made? Right, the, so the man is greater than the tree stump, and so it makes no sense then, does it, to bow down to the trees, does it? Because the maker is always greater than the thing that is made. However, this goes wrong. So we're going to read this together. If you look in Psalm 115, and we will pick it up in uh, verse 4, it says, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of, who's going to finish it for me? The work of their hands, yeah. Whose hands? People's hands, human hands, okay? They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they do not see. The, excellent. They have ears, but they do not, yeah, very good. They have noses, but they do not, smell. They have hands, but they do not. They have feet, but they do not. They, and they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. And so I want to change the phrase, if I can, from we become what we worship into we become like what we make. Okay, because the focus in verse 8 is, yes, it's for the purpose of worship, well, but I don't want to understand worship narrowly. I want to understand it in the context of verse 8. What do people make that is not as great as them, but which they devote their life to? Because whatever that is, that's what you're becoming like. Okay? So now we're, gonna, now we're gonna be able to understand what the idols of today are. Because if we understand them in the context of making things, rather than simply bowing down before them, it's much easier to spot what an idol is um, today. So this is how I want you to look at it. Number one, what are the idols? Um, why do we desire uh, to bow down to an idol? Why do we desire to uh, set our heart and attention on something else. Anybody have an idea? The, the answer is kind of in Jeremiah. So in Jeremiah, they've forsaken God, the, living, the fountain of living waters, but then they turn to something else, cisterns that are similar, but cannot produce water. So the, I'll, I'll give you the answer then. The reason why everybody makes idols or turn to idols of other people is because they are seeking more than anything else the fulfillment of their own desires. Okay? So all idolatry is about what I want. Right from the very beginning. I make things so that I can get what I want from the idol. Now that doesn't make any sense, but that's the logic of idolatry. What am I making, what am I doing to get something from me? In other words, if God is not going to give it to me, then I'm going to turn to something else to get it. That makes no sense, does it? But that is exactly what happens. So the first step in why we turn to idols or why we desire to make things is because we want something that we don't yet have. And the more God has said no or not yet, the more tempted you are to then seek another way of getting it for yourself. Does that make sense? Okay, so I want you to remember this. I want you to think in terms of making now rather than just worshiping, okay? Making instead of just worshiping, verse eight. So the more we are tempted, it is because the desire is we're not getting what we want from God, and so we seek it from somewhere else. So the question is, 
is then how do we make idols? How do we make idols? Now, I wouldn't imagine many of us here today have ever gone out into uh, a forest, chopped down a tree, took it home, and then carved it into the shape of something and bowed, because it wouldn't make any sense to us. But the church makes idols in exactly the same way as they did. They may make different things, but they make idols in exactly the same way. I think one idol that is made most in the church by Christians is goals. Goals. And suddenly, you're making a goal, and before you realize it, that goal is consuming your, all of your attention, all of your time, and the thing that you have made is not greater than you, but it's not long before the thing that you have made becomes your master. Now, the reason why this is dangerous is because goals are not a bad thing. And so in the very beginning, you don't think you're doing anything wrong. Okay, does that make sense? So you don't actually think you're doing anything wrong because goals are good. The trouble is, is the Greek word for lust or desiring in that sense is the word epithemio, which is an inordinate desire, even for a good thing, that it becoming bad. So too much of a good thing can be bad. Make sense? And so, the, how we make them is anything that we are making to give us what we want. So why? Because we want something that we don't have. How? Well, what am I going to pursue to give me that? OK? So <clears throat> I've always been fascinated by people um, who have fallen for get-rich-quick schemes. You know, and they, are, they, are, they abound in the UK. The most famous one in the UK, of which the man eventually went to prison for, he put an advert in, I think it was in the Telegraph, just a little advert saying, if you send me a pound, I will send you back a copy of a letter that will tell you how to make £100,000 within, within this next year. So everyone sent in their pounds, and he told them to put an advert in the newspaper saying, <laughs> you can make a pound. And he got away with it for a long time until, you know, <laughs> so he got his 100,000. I'm not sure if everybody else got theirs. And I think, if my memory serves me correct, um, that he actually got put into jail for that. The thing is, is as we are learning in James, we want the end result without the difficulty of the work, OK? We are bent on not working for things, OK? We, we, we want it easy. And so that there's just another example of wanting something our way rather than the way that God has designed it. Does that make sense? So God tells us right in the very beginning, you can have great blessings, but work for them. OK, but you're not going to get it easy because anything proverbs, anything that comes easy goes easy. Yeah, anything that comes easy goes easy because it's not because um, the thing that you've got is, uh, um, you know, flippant in that sense, but rather because you are, you're fickle in your um, behaviors. And so how do we make idols? It's we make idols by setting things up in such a way that will give us what we want easier than waiting on God. That's how we do it. OK, it's, it's really is that simple. So I'm going to I'm going to trust this rather than God. I'm going to do this rather than God. So what do we. Um, sorry, that's how we make. So how did I just say what do we make? I think I've got my questions muddled up. So what do we make? Goals, how do we make them? How do we make them? And it's the same way as a normal idol is made. You have to spend time. You have to give it attention. You have to set time apart to build it. And so now all of a sudden, I'm making what I want 
through devotion to it, through being committed to something. Okay? Does that make sense? If it doesn't, then say so. Okay? Now, more importantly, what is their influence over us? So I'll just go through the three quickly. We make idols because we desire to. We desire an easy way. It starts with desire. Everything starts with desire. Okay? Then we devote time. So how do we make them? We devote time and attention and resources to them. What do we make? Well, we, anything that will give us what we want. Anything that will give us what we want. What is their effect over us? Well, their effect over us is exactly what we read here in Psalm 115 and exactly what we read in Matthew 13. That if something has eyes but cannot see, what is it? I want the children to answer if possible. If something has eyes but cannot see, what is it? It is... Go on. Well, it, could be a it would be a statue as well, but what else would it be most importantly? Blind. Blind. Okay. If something has ears but cannot hear, what would it be? Yeah, it would, would also be, yeah, so they're all idols. Who's saying that? You, exactly right. Deaf. Okay, if something has hands but cannot feel, actually, that's a difficult one, isn't it? If something has a mouth but cannot speak, what would it be? It would be, so, sorry, what was that? Mute. Mute, that is correct. And so, what God is showing us is that anybody who pursues idolatry becomes deaf, blind, and silent to the things of God. Okay, so God's word speaks, but you don't hear it. God's word brings conviction, but you don't have a heart to feel it. Because your heart and your time has been given over to something else. And so what is happening is that wherever there is the sin of idolatry in your heart, all of your spiritual senses are becoming dull. Okay? So I want you now to think that as you raise your children and as you take them through a very good educational program, the one thing you have to convince them over and over and over again is the thing that is made is never greater than the person who made it. Keep it, right? Because we want to keep things in their proper order. The thing that is made is never greater than the one who made it. So even if you do have a goal, that goal can never be greater than you. Even if you do have the pursuit to have a brilliant job, that job can never be greater than you. And this is the only way to keep her time and attention focused on God first and foremost. God is our maker. He is greater than us. We make things and we are greater than that. And the moment that changes, we become like what we make, which is essentially something that doesn't have life. Because all, all idols are is something that doesn't have a life of its own. Okay, so when God made us, it's not idolatry because God put his breath into us and gave us life. There's, there's a clear and beautiful distinction to be made there. But, because, and we're made in the image of God, which is very different. But when we make things in our image, um, it's, it's more like the Genesis 5 principles. So if you read Genesis 5, though it is clearly stated that the image of God in man is never destroyed or marred, um, it is fallen. And so when you read Genesis 5, you'll read that Adam, sorry, Adam and Eve are made in the image of God, but Adam's son, not, the, not Cain and Abel, but the next one, Seth, um, the third son, is made in the image of Adam. And the reason why it's stated is so that we can see that there is a significant difference between Adam being made in the image of God and us now being made in the image of God, but also in the image of sinful man. Okay? And it's because of that transfer that we now um, fall into idolatry so easily because we try and make things in 
uh, our own image, which is death. It only brings death because we are dead without Christ and therefore we make things that are lifeless. So even the very best things don't give us what we, what we want. So I'll put it simply and then we can ask a few questions if you want. The maker is greater than anything that is made. That applies to God and that applies to us. Okay? Your idolatry can be found not in bowing down to pictures on walls or, or because you've made something you're bowing down to that, but it actually could be that you prefer success over faithfulness. That you want to be successful rather than faithful. Now, I think you can be both. But when, you, when, you, when your desire is to be successful in the world rather than faithful to God, that's a form of idolatry, right? It, because you are measuring yourself against a standard which the world finds acceptable rather than against God and his calling of you. So, for instance, if you have a farmer that goes out and plows the fields for 12 hours a day and plants his crops and harvests his crops, and he does exactly what God has called him to do. He is both successful in one sense, but he's only successful because he's faithful. Now, if you compare that farmer to other successful people around the world, it would be a mistake because the comparison doesn't translate because God hasn't called him to be a banker. God hasn't called him to be an engineer. God hasn't called him to be a lawyer. He's called him to be a farmer. Do you understand? And so it's really important that you understand that as children grow up and grow up in the church, that you have to truly appreciate who they are before God and what God is making them, the skill set that God is giving to them and what God is calling them to be. Because if they, if they move away from being faithful to those things, then they quickly move into the area of worldly success and failure and idolatry and being deaf and blind to the things of God. Does that make sense? I mean, I could explain it much further, but we don't have time, but I want you to see that pattern. Faithfulness to God is what should shape our whole life. Faithfulness to the calling that God has given us is what should shape our whole life. And therefore goals X out with our calling are nothing more than idolatry. You know, I mean, uh, goals, if you want to get fit, if you want to lose weight, I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about anything that seeks to direct the future of your life in a way contrary to the way God has actually stated in his word. And for any of you who think, well, I can do both, no, Jesus nailed it when he says you cannot serve two masters. You will always be tempted to think that you can, but trust me, this is more of a wisdom statement now than it is a biblical statement. Well, it is a biblical statement and a wisdom statement. Trust me, 24 years of hitting the hammer in the right place has taught me that you cannot serve two masters. You just cannot do it. Be faithful to what God has called you to be, and then you will flourish, okay? Anything else will make you deaf, blind, and heartless towards the things of God. You become spiritually dull and no longer able to be uh, practically faithful. Make sense? So these are some... Go on, Jeremiah. Uh, I, you, you've picked over my idol, but if I think about like, the goals, you know, like you're saying, I like goals. So, All right. I didn't... Yeah. But uh, on the opposite side of that spectrum, what, what is the idol of somebody who goes the opposite extreme, won't set any goals, has no motivation? Yeah, so, yeah, I, laziness can be as much of an idol, right? In other words, the, a man who doesn't take responsibility is simply a man who wants to be free from the world that God has placed him in, right? I, I, in other words, I want to be somewhere else. Right? I don't like the world God has put me in, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and remove every means of responsibility from me. So what does that look like? Well, I mean, I've never, I, I heard this phrase probably about 18 months ago, and the moment I heard it, I thought, that's it. That is exactly it. And it was the phrase, fake it till you make it. Ne never heard of it. 
right? And then I began to realize that actually it's worth, it's showing my children, all these teenagers and young adults who claim to have a laptop lifestyle, right? And traveling around the world and earning money and stuff like that. Um, the real sin there is the sin of not being responsible. It's not that you shouldn't perhaps sit on the beach with a laptop and do some work. I, th I think that's probably fine. But the actual sin is not taking the responsibility as God has ordered the world, right? And the fake it to you make it gives children the impression that I can have all of this. But I want you to realize that most people out there, including adults, um, their claims are always greater than the reality. Trust me, you know. I am clearly six foot two. And yeah, that's a claim greater than the reality, okay? That's my point. We, we, okay, so yeah, I, th I think the biggest idolatry outside of, um, in the world today is um, they don't like the world that God has created and they just don't want to take responsibility for anything. I just wanted to add, I think oftentimes, um, it, it, and it's always cool for buying a goal, but if you just equate desires and goals, um, that's helpful to understand. So it's not, how can I get that? Because the, the person that's lazy has to have a goal and how he steps on how he's not going to get lazy. So the goal in itself is not sin. It's the direction the goal is taking. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Yeah. So, in First Corinthians ten, Paul is talking about idols, and he mentions that Gentiles sacrifice unto demons. Would you say that demons are lifeless in the same sense as that Jews were? Um, not in the same sense, but yes, in the sense before God. That they anything that any so something can live, but not be alive. So if you take John 17, um, it tells us that we will be sanctified in the truth, and that eternal life, that is real life, is relationship with God. It is to know God and to know His Son, um, and that's what real life is. And so anything outside of that can live like a plant can live in the world or a tree can. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't say that those things, I think you can make a distinction between a wooden idol and sort of demons, um, but I don't think you can say that they have life in the same way uh, that those who belong to God do. Does that make sense? Yeah? Oh, that's great. Great. Well, shall I pray for us? Father God, we would ask uh, this morning that you would uh, speak to us through your word and that, Father God, this is in many ways uh, convicting in the sense that if we hear your word and don't, it's not going in, then it is an indication to us that we need things explaining to us further. And that very explanation is perhaps the conviction that our heart has become dull to the things of God. And we pray this morning that that never be true of us. And if it is true of us, we repent of that now, that we may be faithful to you in thoughts, in words, and in deeds. In Jesus' name, amen.